Um, I want to thank you all for joining this session um, in SOCAP 2020. Um, you know, I think that many of us uh, experienced the great recession of 2008 and 2009 and felt that we had enough economic normal uh, for our lifetimes. And clearly, uh, that isn't the way it has worked out. Um, but the, the thing about the Great Recession is that the, uh, the recovery that followed that has been known as a jobless recovery. And it has led to some of the most damaging economic inequality that um, has been seen in modern history. And as we sit here in 2020, we have a chance to do better. And that's what this panel is going to be about. And we have wonderful investors and capacity builders and industry leaders to talk about their work in ensuring that economic opportunity is shared more broadly in the recovery. And so before I invite them to share their thoughts, um, I'll just give you um, a little bit of an introduction to myself um, and uh, where I'm coming from on this question. My name is Kate Cochran, and I run a nonprofit organization called Upaya Social Ventures. We invest in early stage companies in India for the purpose of creating jobs for the extreme poor. Uh, so I obviously have um, a, a very strong uh, point of view on this. Um, but when we make our investments, we don't just take the entrepreneur's word for it, that they've created X number of jobs and leave it at that. You know, we follow up and we do interviews and we make sure that those job holders are actually seeing meaningful income increases and that they are seeing more reliability and stability in their jobs and they are beginning, being able to purchase assets, they are beginning to send children to school, the kinds of things that are the hallmarks of dignity in a job. And those are the kinds of things we would like to uh, talk about today. Um, so for our first panelist, um, I'll let her introduce herself and her organization, but I uh, have to jump in and say that Bobal Gupta has been a friend of mine for a very long time and a friend of in this industry um, focused on economic opportunity uh, for a very long time. But last year, she stepped into a role of Pacific Community Ventures as CEO, uh, leading an organization that has really been you know, leading the charge on good jobs for a long time. So, Bobo, why don't we turn things over to you? Thanks, Kate. I appreciate it. Um, and yes, it's been wonderful to be on this journey with you for 15 years now, from uh, microfinance and emerging markets to uh, seeing how that was more and more uh, necessary in the U.S., especially in the Great Recession time, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so my name is Bobo Gupta. Um, I am exactly a year into the CEO role at Pacific Community Ventures, as Kate mentioned, uh, which is a 22-year-old um, organization, CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, uh, based in California, where we provide affordable capital uh, to small and growing businesses throughout the state of California. But we also do a couple of other things. And one thing I should mention about PCV that for the SOCAP community is so perfect is that one of our co-founders uh, was one of the early co-founders of SOCAP, Penelope Douglas. So uh, it's a really lovely, really to speak about PCV work here at SOCAP. Um, so we are unique in the sense that both as a CDFI and as a nonprofit, uh, because we also have two programs that really uh, are meant to address the needs of not just small um, businesses, largely led by entrepreneurs of color who have been rejected by the formal financial industry, which is why CDFIs like we're, us were created 30 years ago, um, but also who have a time um, filling the access to mentorship gap. So we're really trying to play both roles, in many cases, mimicking the VC industry, right? By being able to afford, uh, provide the right kind of capital and the right kind of mentorship network um, to really be able to help uh, with the pre and post investment support that we know that underinvested small business owners need. Um, and our third line of business is our impact investing research and consulting practice that, again, many in the SOCAP community are probably more familiar with. Um, internally for us, that team also really helps make sure that 
as impact investors, we are not only measuring our own impact, um, but that they, that team was the one that really designed for us the good jobs framework a few years ago, um, which brings us into an ability to not only work with our own small business owners on where are they on the good jobs journey when they come into us and how do we help them year over year being able to get the right kind of capital, the right kind of advisor, financial advisor and others as they need them to stay on the good jobs journey with us to make impact and progress on that journey and really help us internally measure whether our portfolio is increasingly addressing the racial and gender wealth gaps and contributing to community wealth building that we really want to be contributing to in our integrated model of how our three teams work together. Um, and then they also work externally with other foundations and impact investors um, of which are in this community. Um, we know that people of color, for example, especially women of color, start more businesses in the U.S. than any other uh, one demographic. 600% um, more so in the last few years have been led by black women, um, small, small businesses in many cases. And by helping them create the kinds of jobs that can really lift the floor and be good quality jobs, dignified jobs, as Kate was saying, uh, we really want to be part of the solution when we're thinking about investing in low wealth communities or communities of color. Um, CDFIs like us, some of you may know, um, certified CDFIs like us have a mandate to invest at least 60% of their capital or more into low and moderate income communities. Um, and in PCV's case, I'm really proud of the fact that uh, last year we ended with over 87% of our capital invested in low and moderate income communities and 80% of our capital into women and entrepreneurs of color specifically. Um, something we are that much more committed to advancing, uh, certainly this year, um, and even more so uh, as we see how the crisis is really particularly played out, um, particularly for entrepreneurs of color uh, in the U.S. So uh, I will I will save a little bit more beyond the intro uh, in that regard, um, but really lovely to be here and part of this conversation. Oh, Kate, I think you're muted. Meredith, do you want to kick off your intro? And yeah, we'll come back to um, okay, sure. back and forth. Yep. So, um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Um, I'm Meredith Shields with the Sorensen Impact Foundation. Um, and just a bit on us, so the Sorensen Impact Foundation is a family foundation based in Salt Lake City, Utah, and founded by Jim Sorensen. So we were founded by an entrepreneur, um, and for that reason, almost 100% of what we do is supporting entrepreneurs in the impact space. Um, we invest in impact investments both through our programs dollars, so 5% of the foundation that goes out as programs, program related investments or grants. And we also um, invest out of the other 95%. So we are a foundation that is 100% invested in impact investments um, across everything from public equities to early stage entrepreneurs around the world. We are a global investor. So we're active on five continents right now. We support um, companies that are providing, <coughs> excuse me, access to healthcare, access to education. Um, and I think what's important about us for this conversation is that as an investor, um, oftentimes the largest expense item when you're looking at an income statement is salaries and benefits. And for us as an impact investor, we take a multi-stakeholder approach. So we, we look at for each company that we invest in, similar to what Kate described that Upaya does, um, we think about not just the beneficiaries of the products and services that our investments are producing, but also the types of jobs that are created, the income and earning potential, as well as the development and upskilling or reskilling opportunities that are being provided by the companies. And as an investor and an impact investor, we believe that this yields better performing portfolio companies um, and much higher impact overall. So I'll save the rest for <laughs> later on as well. Um, and it looks like we have Rachel joining us. 
Hi there. Oh, good. Can you hear me? You, you are uh, seeing her a little before I am. Can you all hear me? I'm so I sorry. I can hear you. That was yeah, absurdly we... difficult. I'm sure that it was entirely my fault. Um, hi, no worries. Everyone. We were just doing intros. Go for it. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll jump right in. Um, so my name is Rachel Myers, and I um, lead our um, economic opportunity and impact investing programs at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we are the nation's largest integrated health system. We have over 12 million members who we provide health care and coverage to um, in California, in uh, Oregon, Washington, um, in uh, Georgia, in Hawaii, in Colorado, and then um, on the, in the Middle Atlantic states, in Maryland, or Northern Virginia, and um, uh, uh, Washington DC. And we, you know, um, obviously our principal concern is to um, support the health of our members and, and to provide really good quality and affordable health care. Um, but we've learned, I think, along with the rest of um, the healthcare community, um, that a lot of what impacts on people's health happens um, far outside of the, the healthcare setting. And, and so we sort of call that the upstream determinants of health or um, we've now come to call it social health. Um, so as an integral part of that is, um, you know, economic opportunity, people's um, ability to earn an income and, um, and build wealth over time. Those have obviously direct impacts on housing stability and food security, which are, are very directly related to health as well as many other factors. Um, so it related to kind of this panel, I think we we do know that um, good jobs specifically really matter for health. Um, we see that unemployment increases a number of adverse health outcomes, um, increases um, you know mortality rates, um, and then sort of on the flip side, we also just in this country, um, employment is often tied. Uh, people's health benefits and their access to health care is often tied to employment, and so unemployed people are also less likely to have. Um, you know, safe and affordable access to healthcare. So we see good jobs as sort of important for individuals um, and just their sense of self-worth and um, their ability to maintain their health as, a, as well as their ability to access healthcare. So we have a, a number of different ways that um, we're working to support um, good jobs that hopefully we'll be able to share today. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Rachel, and I'm so happy to have you. Um, now, now I'm not uh, distracted by trying to find where in the ether you are. Uh, so, so that uh, sort of lays the groundwork uh, for the um, wonderful women we have on this panel. And, you know, I should have uh, kicked off by just saying, isn't it awesome to have all, an all-women panel? Um, I want to uh, move into just a conversation uh, and ask the panelists some questions and um, any of you are welcome to, uh, to add on. And then I promise that we will uh, leave some time to try to grab questions from the chat box. It's a little hard to um, separate the questions from the introductions, but I promise I will do my best. Um, let me kick off um, first and um, have a question for Bulbul. You know, obviously, we are all experiencing different kinds of challenges um, in 2020 and uh, with COVID for the particular kind of work that you're doing. Describe the kinds of challenges you've experienced this year and how you've overcome them. Ah, thanks for asking. Um, so uh, <laughs> where to start? Um, so we work directly with small businesses throughout the state of California. Um, uh, as I said, many of them are uh, minority businesses, and uh, we saw very early uh, when the shelter in place order started, we know that the bulk of our businesses don't have more than one to two months of runway uh, to survive, right? So uh, we tried really hard to start activating um, capital, our own you know, existing funders, new funders, just trying to raise the uh, alarm for folks who may, may or may not be directly uh, connected with small business communities um, we saw, for example, with the federal stimulus package um, that, you know, even though it's to businesses and help keep more of them afloat, uh, when you design a process from the top down that inherently leaves out the entire industry of CDFIs that were it, like created to serve that community, um, that big banks are not good at serving. And because of the systemic discrimination and redlining that we've had in the industry for many years, um, that even when they, you know, included CDFIs in the second round, 
um, it was too late for many small businesses um, and they were still disconnected from some of the larger CDFIs that were pulled in um, who might be SBA lenders and have the kinds of assets under management that were allowed to participate, um, but may or may not have the direct connection with the small business owners, especially entrepreneurs of color, um, who wouldn't even qualify for SBA lending, which is the bulk, the bread and butter of our lending portfolio. Um, so for the uh, overall, we have kept our lending available. We have connected folks with other lenders. Uh, we work a lot to connect anybody who reaches out to us with our business advising platform uh, so that even if they can't get an immediate, you know, yes for capital, um, they can at least work with a financial advisor maybe to refinance or a marketing advisor to pivot online, reach customers directly, um, just to be able to keep even partial revenues going because that can be a make or break for a lot of small businesses. Just being able to keep some partial revenues going also allows them to stay eligible for capital in the following month so that we and other capital providers can say yes easily, more easily compared to if they have no revenues going. Um, we've already seen almost 50% of black owned small businesses in California alone go under. And that uh, is about 27%, I think, nation nationally. Um, but California has the largest number of diverse owned small businesses in the country. 33% um, of Latinx owned small businesses in California have already gone under, um, according to the June NBER reports. And so um, if, you know, if we don't see additional both federal support and much more uh, capital through what we call the capillary system of smaller banks, community banks, CDFIs, uh, reaching these communities soon, they're not the, the rounds of PPP and idle support they got weren't enough to last to this extent. Um, we've seen spikes in our lending capital of over 20, um, 20x in the spring um, when the, the shelter in place order started, um, over 5x uh, on our business advising team. And we were really lucky this summer to be able to work with Kaiser and Rachel's team um, to be able to scale up the business advising platform. Um, to be able to offer that to more uh, Black and entrepreneurs of color nationwide, um, because that is such an important um, piece of uh, mentorship to be able to keep more of these small businesses, whether you know refinancing or marketing or whatever support we can get them. Uh, and they often find other uh, lending or capital providers through those uh, advisors as well. It's usually our biggest um, uh, source of referrals in many cases. We've also worked really hard um, in the state of California with the governor's office and a group of other CDFIs, Kiva, um, some capital providers to be able to come together. Uh, and I think the governor is meant to launch this next week or in a couple of weeks, uh, the California Small Business Rebuilding Fund, uh, which is uh, meant to provide some uh, capital to the entrepreneurs who may or may not have gotten PPP support, but could really use some capital to stay afloat. Um, and similar to the New York and Chicago funds that launched earlier this spring, um, late spring, um, we expect that fund to be oversubscribed within two days. That's what they experienced. Um, so we're really trying to uh, raise as much affordable capital into CDFIs as possible to be able to keep our doors and others CDFIs doors open uh, for the entrepreneurs we know need us, um, especially as we anticipate and are hearing more and more about some additional COVID spikes coming this winter, um, which will only hurt our small business community and the jobs and the workers that they support, the families that those workers support and that ripple effect through our communities. These are the culture keepers in our community, right? Think of your favorite local restaurant, your favorite local shops, um, when those shut down, the ripple effect that has in our local communities and the culture of our local communities, um, that is, it's, it's really, really hard to come back. Once you close a business, most businesses never reopen. Um, and lastly, I will just say that, you know, we already saw half of generational black wealth wiped out in the Great Recession. We are very much on the brink of that right now. So if we do not see more capital, affordable capital provided through CDFIs, who are best positioned to be able to reach these communities. Um, we're really seeing how that impact is gonna play out all over again. Um, and frankly, a lot of foundations, corporates are still on the sidelines. They're still trying to reassess or figure out, you know, is more government support coming? Where is my support needed? Some of them may have acted in the immediate crisis. Some of them return calls after the George Floyd murder happened. Um, but many of them honestly have not still 
um, gotten off the sidelines and we need people to get off the sidelines and help whether it is grant capital, whether it's affordable capital, um, lending PRIs. Uh, there's a big effort to engage like half my DAF um, that folks have launched, um, but it's really all hands on deck. And I think for many of us, the conversations we have with many um, foundations and impact investors, I hear over and over again, like, wow, I had no idea it was that bad. When I quote like the NBER statistics I was sharing earlier, um, which, or that, people still felt like it was in crisis mode and felt like, oh, the unemployment numbers are getting better. So maybe there is a little bit more of a recovery happening. We don't see that yet. We're still in crisis mode. And many of these businesses are, are about to be in even worse crisis mode this winter if what we anticipate plays out. So um, that's that's what we're, we're trying to get as much capital out the door as fast as we can uh, with this great, uh, California fund uh, setup that we've done with the California iBank um, that allows us to really leverage capital 10x um, and be able to revolve loans faster and faster. So we're working really hard to be able to, to get that out the door as best we can. Thank you, Bulbul. I think that this, this theme of getting capital out the door, trying to provide a bridge to our businesses, and I love that phrase of culture keepers. I'm going to use that. Um, the, the, the businesses that are providing our community jobs, I think, is going to be um, a topic for the next few days here at SOCAP. Um, unless uh, Meredith or Rachel has anything they want to add specifically to that, I'd like to, to ask Meredith, you know, I know the Sorensen Impact Foundation moved very quickly at the beginning of the crisis to um, bring together other investors and um, to look to provide capital to these kinds of companies that were you know, fostering economic opportunity. What was your thinking beyond, beyond that? And, and, and how are you thinking about when we move beyond crisis and into recovery? Sure, this is, um, this is my favorite topic. So thank you for asking. Um, we so the the context for where we came from um when the the crisis broke out this year is that for a couple years now we've been trying to explore how we can use the resources and assets that we have beyond our financial assets to bring more people into impact investing so for example we have people that fly around the world sourcing potential investments and grantees um, and then we have an amazing team at the Sorensen Impact Center that performs robust due diligence. And I get to see those reports and that research and that information. Um, but nobody outside of our organization has historically benefited from that. And I think that's typical within the financial and investment communities. Um, and we felt like that was a terrible loss. So when COVID broke out, it, the conversation turned from this would be really nice to this has to happen like right now in order for people to move quickly um, and to have a, a faster, more efficient impact and do as much as we can. So um, on top of deploying capital to our own portfolio companies to keep them going, as Bobo mentioned, it sounds like we were aligned in the way we're thinking there. Um, reached out to other investors in our network and we're excited to learn of a number of coalitions, the R3 coalition, which some of you may have heard about earlier this morning, um, as well as Village Capital um, quickly launched a digital solution called Abica uh, that brings together investors um, around social entrepreneurs um, and small businesses through the growth stage actually around the world. Um, and so we, we jumped into both of those feet first and started contributing our pipeline. So any deal that we saw, we tried to get those companies also put themselves on these platforms. Um, and then we tried to find a way to share our research. So we had our team out there presenting almost like they were presenting our investment committee um, pitch to other investors around the world, whoever would dial in. Um, and we view that as a way to somewhat efficiently attract more capital to the entrepreneurs who, who needed it most and in a time of crisis. And so Kate, you asked, how do we see that um, going forward even when we're past the crisis? And I wanna talk about um, inclusion for a second because one great thing about the way that we've been working through the crisis is that I think 
organizations have been more open to sharing, more open to, to asking, hey, what, are, what other deals are you seeing? What can we bring together since we're all limited right now by the virtual environment? And by and large, the feedback I'm hearing is that that's opening organizations to broader access to different types of deal flow, um, different types of entrepreneurial networks and resources. Um, and so my hope is that through this more collaborative approach, um, through these more high level um, deal aggregating resources like Abaca, that we can start to democratize access. On my panel earlier, somebody asked, how do you get in? How do you get money if you're starting a business? And I know that, Bobo, you get that question a lot from entrepreneurs, but um, it, taking away that veil is something that we've, we've seen work fairly well during the crisis, and we'd like to keep that going in the future. That's great. And I'm so glad to hear you say that. I've been hearing um, both, both um, here at SOCAP, but just in general in the industry, more of a spirit of collaboration. And, you know, we talk a lot about how the missing middle is where the jobs are created, but it is the missing middle because it's hard to invest there. But the more we um, who do invest there start sharing our deals, um, the more we make it easier for the entrepreneurs who need the capital right now. So I think that's a really, really great point. Um, Rachel, I know you had um, some examples that you wanted to share, and I know it's not ideal. Um, at one point, um, you, you might have wanted to share some slides. I think it's possible, but no, nope. okay. It, at least on my screen, I know it's really, really small. <laughs> oh, Rachel, and uh, you're still on mute. No, I'm happy to just, oh, there we go. just speak to it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think um, just to pick up on the theme of kind of being able to move quickly um, as we started to see what was happening at the start of the pandemic. I mean, obviously, as a healthcare institution, we were pretty focused elsewhere um, in the early days of March and April and whatnot. But I think um, we, you know, we had been having conversations with um, uh, people like Bobol and, and PCV and, and other organizations about you know, the idea of supporting small businesses, the idea of supporting job um, uh, job growth in our communities as sort of core to our ability to promote healthy, uh, to promote health in our communities for, for some time. And so I think that helped us because we had those relationships be able to, you know, check in and say, how, how are things these days um, and and pivot. And, and we, um, we made a pretty significant commitment um, in, uh, late June of this year, our CEO announced $100 million towards um, addressing racial equity and um, and promoting economic opportunity in our communities and sort of the economic opportunity piece, both looking at um, addressing racial justice and also looking at um, responding to kind of the immediate crisis. And so as part of that, our collaboration with PCV, um, uh, we also have a, a pretty significant partnership with LISC. Um, we have a $60 million um, investment partnership that we've both contributed $30 million um, dollars into. And that um, investment comes from our corporate treasury. Um, so that was some, that was actually literally years in the making and we were just able to activate it um, this summer. So, um, and, and that um, collaboration, we also have a grant aspect to that. It's, it's looking at, um, investing in businesses responding to the crisis but um it's actually you know it was designed prior to the crisis and and it is looking at sort of recovery and and really centering job growth and neighborhood wealth in in recovery and so um we have one uh, piece of that that i uh, just wanted to share today which is um it's we call it the good jobs fund and um, it's a $20 million impact debt fund that um, offers flexible financing to small businesses that are um, intentionally bringing quality jobs. And so it's it's very focused on supporting minority owned businesses, but it is sort of more uh, mid-level businesses that, um, that are major job creators that have also demonstrated a commitment to job quality. So we've looked at deals. Um, we have a worrying conversation with a, a call center business um, that's looking at expanding into multi, uh, different cities they have sort of a growth mentality of of, of um, taking over uh, sort of failing like malls, like retail blight 
and converting those into call center facilities, they have a very strong commitment, not only to hiring from sort of untapped talent pools and underserved communities, um, but also to um, providing really good wages and, and just amazing supports to their employees, like home ownership programs and things like this. So um, one, of our, uh, one of our investments is looking sort of explicitly at this job quality issue, um, as well as you know, being aware, obviously, of the context of the, of the recovery. The other thing that I just did want to share, I mean, and I think it is really important for institutions like ours that, you know, it's amazing that we have our treasury assets and, and our, our, our corporate treasury is willing to do some impact investing. And of course, that we have grant capital and we're making it available to our communities. Um, but we're also looking very deeply at, you know, our own hiring practices, um, recognizing that healthcare is a career, especially an organization like ours, we, we, we're very committed to our, um, our labor partnerships. Um, most of our workforce is unionized. Um, we're, we're really looking at, you know, how do we find individuals that are underemployed um, or unemployed in our um, communities and, and help track them into some of the more entry level jobs that um, can then get them, you know, um, on a path uh, to, to, uh, to advancement in, in healthcare. Um, and to a better stable career. Um, we also do the same thing with our business partners. Um, one sort of uh, COVID related story is, you know, I, I'm sure everybody heard about the um, personal protective equipment supply chain issues. Um, and we had relationships in LA. Um, we had sort of commitment among a lot of our business um, leaders to, and they, they built a partnership with apparel, um, apparel factories in uh, LA, in Los Angeles. To, um, to create masks and gowns and a number of other things that we needed for our personal protective equipment um, and, and to save those jobs in LA. So we have, I think, built um, a lot of institutional commitment to these issues that sort of stretches across the different ways that we um, engage our communities. Wow, that's, it's so interesting to hear, you know, Kaiser has so many angles um, to come at uh, this particular question. I'm curious when you talk about um, the investments you've made that are, are specifically thinking about quality jobs. Do you, does Kaiser have a point of view about what are the elements of a, of a quality job, what you're looking for? Well, we like, we like PCV's framework. <laughs> um, that's part of the reason we're working with them. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and LISC is now working with them too, which is great. Um, I think, you know, we, we definitely believe in um, fair, um, you know, family sustaining wages. We believe in benefits. Obviously, that's also sort of selfish. Um, I mean, self interested, but but of course, we we think that jobs should provide benefits. They should provide leave, sick leave. Um, we have some work we do on the policy side that encourages um, cities to adopt um, sick leave policies. So we. We, I think, sort of would check the boxes that um, you would see anybody check, and and we we judge ourselves against the same criteria. Great, thanks, Bobo. Looks you. like you had something to add in on that. Yeah, no, I appreciate the uh, the word of support there, Rachel. Um, I shared the link to our Good Jobs framework in the chat, just so everybody has it, because um, it's not as easy to share screens right now. Um, but it's, it's our online toolkit to be able to uh, work directly for small business owners. So that's the target audience for that website. Um, with micro actions, um, even pre-crisis, right? We launched this internally after years of research. Like, what does it mean to have a quality job in America? Uh, launched it in 2016 as a piece of research. Uh, and then user tested it within our own lending portfolio. Um, got some feedback from our, our own entrepreneurs and launched it online just a year ago um, and had just started raising our first cohort of good jobs advisors over the winter to be able to match our small business owners directly, not just with a financial advisor uh, on our platform, but you know, for those really committed to the good jobs journey um, to be able to work more hand in hand with an advisor uh, specifically on HR and um, scaffolding the HR and finance uh, um, on a quarterly basis to really figure out you know, when can I make that next investment to be able to help my staff on professional development or on uh, maybe exploring employee ownership or what is, you know, what does that next step for me look like? 
Um, and right now, uh, I guess one thing also to note pre-crisis, um, we were the first CDFI last year to ever be able to offer incentive payments um, within our lending, we call them loan rebates, uh, to our lending clients who were making progress on any of the quality job uh, framework. So we, as impact investors, right, it's in our roots of our whole organization, uh, we were really looking at how do we do blended finance through our capital model to be able to create a little bit more of a stickiness effect with our lending clients um, that could say, hey, you know, we know you need affordable capital. We know you could probably work with a financial advisor, but we really want to stay committed with you on this good jobs agenda. Um, and we're willing to show up in the way you need us to, um, to be able to help you stay on that journey with us. Um, now, given the crisis that we have, um, we are not only trying to, you know, keep people on the good jobs journey for those it and continue to grow, um, but really also play a jobs preservation and impact preservation agenda as much as we can. Um, so with whatever grant capital we can raise to be able to beef up those micro grants within our lending to a meaningful enough small grants program, especially for a lot of our entrepreneurs of color who need affordable capital even more so, who maybe weren't reached enough by PPP or other programs yet, to be able to just hang on to their business and hang on to as many jobs as they can. Because as we know, if a business closes, it's almost never gonna come back again. But if we can help folks just ride out the tide of the crisis a little bit better, there's a lot more we can then do to continue their trajectory on the good jobs journey with us. Um, so we're doing this in a couple of ways. One is uh, raising, you know, I was talking about affordable capital earlier to really be able to launch a little bit more of a small grants program. Uh, especially within uh, California to be able to pair with our lending capital. Uh, we're doing this with, by also working with some of the other Black-led CDFIs. Uh, Rachel was mentioning LISC that they're also partnering with. We're also working with Hope Credit Union across the Deep South, Appalachia Community Capital across the Appalachian region, and a handful of others. Uh, we were already part of an Entrepreneurs of Color Fund with some CDFIs nationwide where we are you know, helping them um, access these advisors and good jobs advisors to reach their small business clients in cities like the Bronx and Detroit and others. Um, because, you know, we really obviously, beyond being committed to good jobs um, as businesses can afford, you know, additional increments of the framework, uh, right now, keeping that impact on track and really figuring out as impact investors, how do we continue to innovate and provide the products and services that our entrepreneurs and especially our entrepreneurs of color need and are asking for even more so that we show up in the way that they need us to, to keep them on this journey with us. Um, and then one last thing I, I will just say that I think might be important to note, when we think about our underwriting as an investment into these small business owners, we already saw pre-crisis that entrepreneurs of color, um, when we were doing our underwriting in the last couple of years, tend to underreport things like personal assets, whether it's because we, um, they distrust the financial system that their assets might be seized if a debt goes under, or because they don't you know, think their personal assets have enough worth worth reporting. Um, for a variety of reasons, we have been really innovative in playing with our lending criteria to be able to make sure that we are not being unintentionally punitive so when we think about sort of systemic change to be able to show up with the kind of capital and have the kind of outcome through our small business owners as agents of change, being able to invest in them better with a whole entrepreneur approach that's a little bit closer to character-based lending was really important for us to get to so that we're you know, not looking at a minimum credit score, we're not looking at sort of the, the tight credit boxes that fintechs or banks tend to look at, because our whole design is to reach the community that gets rejected by banks, SBA, and even in many cases, fintechs um, that have a tighter credit box and look for a higher minimum credit score than we do. So just really thinking deeply about if we want to invest better and better in entrepreneurs of color, and if we want to have the kind of community wealth building and racial wealth gap outcomes through them, um, through creating good quality jobs, what are we doing up and down our policies and our work to really make sure that we are doing the systems change we need to do within our organization 
and within our industry and being able to better and better communicate that with stakeholders, especially this year, um, to be able to try to keep some of those jobs and as many of those jobs and families uh, supported as we can. Great, thank you. Um, so that is a really rich um, understanding of how to support our uh, local communities here in the United States. I want to pivot a little bit um, with you, Meredith. Um, because uh, the Sorensen Impact Foundation and Upaya Social Ventures co-invested in a deal um, this year, uh, which was all about jobs um, in a company called LAL10. And I have to say that when Meredith shared the um, term sheet with me, it was unlike anything I have seen yet. And all we do is invest uh, for, for jobs, but it had very particular terms in the, in the term sheet about job creation and income improvement for those, uh, for the artisans involved. Um, Meredith, Meredith, you want to uh, comment about sort of how you think about embedding your values into your investing? Sure. Um, so the term sheet that you're referring to um, was an example of how we're trying to pivot when, when we say we're impact investors, it's interesting because you look at um, term sheets and oftentimes you don't see the impact in the term sheet. It's the financial terms laid out the same way that any other investor looks at a deal. Um, and we, we, we wanted to explore that and think through how do we create some accountability um, in an achievable way that's supportive to, to entrepreneurs, but also, I, I like the word you use, Bobo, incentives. Um, creating incentives to have a multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, especially when it comes to, to jobs and employees, I think, um, that if you're focused on the wrong area, that can become an expense to reduce, not an asset to leverage. And so um, what we did in the Lal Tan deal is, so the, this company organizes artisans in India and provides them with skills development and access to supply chain um, and lots of coaching and mentoring so that they can increase their income through aggregated sale of their products to um, retailers around the world. And when we started looking at the company, we liked the fact that they had really impressive, um, it, not only number of jobs that they were creating, so upwards of a thousand every year um, that they've been operating. It'll reach almost 2000 this year, um, but also the income increase was really impressive. So, so far this year, the artisans who've been working with Lal 10 have increased their income by over 23% in a fairly short period of time. Um, so we said, okay, great. I'm, we're so happy to see that. So the key deal terms in our, our term sheet, so the discount rate um, and the valuation cap are actually on a little grid um, that's front and center in the, in the term sheet. And the, the rate that they get is more beneficial to the entrepreneur if they're overachieving on the impact side. So if the um, benefit to the artisans who are by and large their employees um, is increasing over time. And so we felt like that was one way that we can we can act with impact at the forefront of what we're doing, but also align everybody's incentives so that the company's incentivized to continue to develop so that they produce better products that generate more revenue. Um, so for that, that one was a no brainer solution for us. And so far they're tracking and they're doing really well. They are. And um, they also pivoted really quickly um, with PPP. Mm -hmm. Um, or PPE, sorry, um, too many P acronyms this year. Um, all right, we have a little over 10 minutes left. And um, can I just say three cheers to Bulbul, who is not only speaking very eloquently, but also staying on top of the chat and responding to people quickly. Um, uh, but, but we have had um, some questions that I want to just um, put out to the um, broader group um, uh, Evan Gill uh, puts, are you working with, um, are, are any of you working with worker owned or multi-stakeholder cooperatives as a means of workforce development and equity? And Bobo, I know you answered this in the chat, but maybe you can um, speak to this and then Meredith um, and Rachel, you can as well. Uh, sure, happy to take it off. Um, so yeah, we definitely look for these within our lending as much as we can. 
uh, both of the applications coming in if they're interested or where our lending can be um, supportive in helping companies convert into worker ownership. Um, we definitely have some of these in our early history at PCV where we started as an equity investor for the first several, ye several years before pivoting into um, CDFI small business lending. Um, we also partner with organizations like Project Equity and a handful of others that are particularly trying to serve multi-stakeholder uh, worker co-ops uh, and support those conversions where our lending capital can be valuable in the capital stack um, and to be able to access our advising platform because often being able to work with a financial advisor and making that um, conversion happen is really important. Um, I think just one thing to note, we've seen uh, when we talk about minority owned small businesses, especially, um, we have not only seen a lot of them close up with the last uh, Great Recession, but, um, and we're definitely starting to see that again, but for the most part, uh, we see them bought out by middle and larger size companies, not to convert to worker ownership and keep the wealth, either because someone in their family doesn't want to take over the business or um, because they weren't able to or weren't exposed to worker co-op models or financing. So we're also really trying to work with minority supplier development councils um, that are nationwide and regional in the country to really be able to make sure that uh, we're integrating into their messaging and work to try to keep wealth in um, black owned communities, for example, uh, and to help make those ownership conversions happen. So a um, variety of different, you know, combination of, of lending, advising, and some, some policy and partnerships work um, to be able to uh, um, reach those uh, folks better. I'll jump in. To, oh, go ahead, Meredith. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just going to jump in. So, um, as part of the Good Jobs Fund that I mentioned, our partnership with LISC, we, um, conversions to employee ownership is a, sort of a priority there and um, very interested. And I'll, I'll put just the, um, the contact information for that fund in the chat um, in case people are interested in learning more. Um, and then on the other side, the other thing that we are looking at is looking at our supply chain and trying to understand some of our, um, particularly our diverse suppliers. So we, we're a member of the Billion Dollar Roundtable. We spend actually close to $2 billion a year with diverse um, uh, businesses. And we, we are kind of looking at um, those business partners and particularly in the area of um, construction and building related trades, we're seeing a lot of minority entrepreneurs kind of reaching retirement age and not showing a lot of interest or their families not showing interest in taking over the business considering selling the business. Um, and so we are doing actually a kind of a deep assessment of our supply chain, our, our, of our diverse suppliers to understand if there are some among them who may be willing and open to a discussion around employee ownership and um, then providing them and connecting them with technical support, potentially capital, um, not our capital, but um, like a, our partnership with LIST, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't think we would direct lend to a supplier, but uh, at least not right now. <laughs> Um, but but just trying to use those different influence pieces and the fact that, um, you know, we want to maintain our business relationship with those entities and that could be um, a very strong aspect of a, of a conversion uh, business plan. That's great. And Rachel, uh, and sorry, Meredith, I think you had something to add as well. Yeah, I was just going to give um, it, it, just an example of, you know, from, uh, from our perspective, we admittedly don't see as many worker owned um, proposals. But when we do, I would say that we tend to be biased, positive and, and error towards those solutions, because again, it's a multi stakeholder approach. So we like the idea of building wealth within communities, not just with a entrepreneur or shareholders who may or may not be located in communities, um, but with the workers themselves. So an example, um, we're invested in a, a company in Liberia where um, the majority of the workforce is female and the women own 50% um, of the factory, the assets um, of the business and the company itself and will continue to earn um, even when they're not working there. Um, and then another example is we have a, a company here in the United States, it's called um, Indie Dwell, and they're an affordable housing producer. They, they have a really neat model where they go into communities, partner with the communities, and then their employees own 20 or 25% of each factory as well. 
Um, this company also pays a living wage. They fully pay for health care. Um, they put their employees through vocational education. I mean, they really are impact uh, in all angles. Um, and from our perspective, companies who are, who are thinking about it that way, again, it's such aligned incentives that as an impact investor, we, we gravitate towards those types of solutions. Great. Thank I'm you. And, and all about this. Sorry, go ahead, Bubble. I was just going to jump in. I think Meredith pointed out something interesting where she was saying um, that they don't see a lot of these coming at them in terms of investment capital ask. Um, I think one thing we saw in our research, in our good jobs research last year, pre crisis in our impact survey, was that the companies that we were making the most good jobs progress with, uh, with their workers, tended to be companies that were you know, slightly on the larger size of small business and largely white male owned. So that for us, there is an inherent conversation internally, um, ongoing month by month of yes, we are committed to good jobs and for all you know, low and moderate income communities where the bulk of our capital goes, um, but we are also really committed to investing in BIPOC owned small businesses. And so that inherent challenge of how do we help support more of those folks that tend to be smaller and younger in size of business earlier stage um, with the kind of capital and advisory support that reaches them where their needs are to just get them in and help them on that journey. Maybe they aren't as fully baked coming in. Um, I think we see similar demographics, frankly, in the past in the B-Lab community. So really just trying to translate the language we use around impact and community um, in a way that resonates uh, with the language that the communities that we want to reach even better use, I think is something we have continued to learn and iterate on um, to make sure we're not coming at them with impact investing language that they don't use or they don't necessarily connect with immediately um, to translate it into their language better. So just uh, a word of uh, sort of insight that uh, I think we share uh, at least a, similar to some of what Meredith was saying earlier. Great, thank you, thank you, Bulbul. And I was going to sort of in a similar vein, just you know, in, in terms of um, impact investing language and the, and the kind of capital that is available. You know, one of the things that is, has um, frustrated me as an investor um, is we're an equity investor, and so typically we can't support co-ops um, for, for legal reasons. We just can't get our capital in. And yet, because they really do represent what we're trying to do, which is you know, wealth generation and stability for the job holders, um, you know, we are actually beginning to move to more debt um, because that's the kind of capital that they need and that's helpful. Um, I think we have time for one more question, um, which is, do you have any examples, this is Nicole Tanner, of ways in which you're working in partnership with any public sector partners, such as health, education, and or social services? And I will let um, anyone take that uh, if you've got a response for Nicole. I can share a few things, um, not explicitly investment related, but, um, so one piece we, but good jobs related, I suppose. Um, one thing um, we announced a couple, like a month or two ago, a partnership with the state of California to um, to hire 500 contact tracers in the state. Um, that is um, uh, essentially to support uh, uh, COVID-19 spread um, by tr uh, by um, contacting people who have uh, encountered a um, a COVID positive individual. So um, as part of that, we are working with a, a nonprofit institution, um, Public Health Institute, and um, we are focusing on underemployed people of color for the job roles, and, and we built into the partnership sort of good pay and benefits. And so just from that angle, um, again, not necessarily an investment opportunity. The other um, area that we're very deeply involved in is in schools, um, K through 12, and we've had relationships with schools throughout our footprint, um, our our markets for uh, over, uh, over a decade. Um, we have a program called Thriving Schools, and initially it was really focused on healthy eating and, and um, activity. And in the last couple of years, it's really pivoted to be um, really focused on resilience and, and mental health, both of the students and of the faculty. Um, and so, and then we've also done a lot of work through that um, to 
to we developed a playbook for kind of safe and healthy reopening of schools. Um, and so we have, we, we're, we're kind of able to triangulate a lot of things. Um, we've also been involved, there's a, um, a collaboration that an organization called Healthcare Without Harm has been supporting that looks at um, actually food, um, food sourcing for schools and healthcare. And that does have an investment um, component that we, we haven't directly invested today, but we've been more supporting on the, um, on the supply chain side. So we've touched them from a few different angles. That's, that's great. Um, and that is perfect timing, Rachel. Thank you. Um, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, and I just want to thank our incredibly concrete and specific and um, valuable partners today. You know, this was not a uh, high level conceptual talk. It's about how do you really make it happen? Um, and we all know that a good job is the path to stability and to building a life that, that um, allows you to pursue your dreams. So thank you to Bobel and Meredith and Rachel and all of you for being part of this. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in other sessions over the next few days and uh, over the course of our work. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bye everyone. All. See you guys. Bye. Bye.